Wow. It is a pleasure to be here today. Thank you so much for coming, even in the rain. I just can't believe it. Um, over the past year, I have had the opportunity to serve as a member of the Women's Conference Planning Committee, and it has been one of the greatest experiences of my life. I love the women with whom I have served and have been so impressed with how much work, effort, and prayer goes into making this conference possible. We started clear back in August, and look at where we are today. And I am just so grateful for that. I'm grateful to be here at such a time as this. Thank you again to all involved. También queremos dar una bienvenida a todos que hablan el idioma celestial. Nos sentimos muy agradecidos de estar con ustedes en esta conferencia, y gracias por venir. This is actually my first time attending, unlike my dad, who's come many times. Um, actually, he, one time he was clear up there, and as women would try to get past him, they would trip over the big briefcase that he always carries. And he finally said to the lady next to him, this is so embarrassing. I'm one of the only men here, and I have the biggest purse. <laughs> It's true. I, I have been able to be here before, and I've loved every minute of it. What a day we've had today. It wasn't enough to just have thunder. It wasn't enough to just have lightning. It wasn't enough just to arrive in the rain. No, then we had to have hail. And we all got drenched as we marched across campus, umbrellas blowing in the wind. But I knew I was at women's conference when the sisters stood up in one of the sessions to say the prayer and said, Heavenly Father, thank thee so much for the moisture. <laughs> we're making memories, sisters, and we're making friends. I'm grateful for the friends I've met just today. I met a young lady who's here from New Jersey. I met a, two sisters from Mesquite, Nevada. I met some sisters from Centerville, some sisters from Southern California, and we're making memories. These are memories that will last throughout our entire lives. This chance to be with Wendy today is a memory that I will treasure throughout my entire life. So thank you, yes, for being here and making this day something special. Thank you for those who provided the music. This has just been incredible to hear the music throughout the entire day. Those of you who sang in the choir this morning and all who have presented, the music has been wonderful. The messages have been just great. As I've gone from session to session, drenched in my, in my uh, wet suit coat, I've just been so uplifted by the stories of conversion and by the testimonies that have been born. What a beautiful, beautiful experience to be here. So yes. I have participated in women's conference before, and I hope to participate many times in the future because I love this. We even participated when we were on the other side of the world. I gathered all the sisters in our mission, and we gathered together to watch the broadcast while we were in Chile. Con mi hija quiero expresar mi amor para todas las hermanas que están aquí escuchando a muchos discursos en inglés cuando no es su idioma. Sé que requiere más esfuerzo y les estimo mucho. Que Dios les bendiga. Yo les quiero con todo mi corazón. I'm glad to be here with my daughter Wendy, also my wife, and my other daughter, Whitney, who's 16. It's wonderful to be able to be with them at this women's conference. We enjoyed hearing from Sister Wendy Watson Nelson this morning. What a powerful message she gave. She talked about you being foreordained, having missions, being in the right place at the right time. She spoke of many women who have come to this conference looking for more purpose. But I have a secret. I know of many women who are here seeking less purpose. <laughs> <laughs> so whatever, whatever side of that coin you are on, you are in the right place at the right time. And we appreciated Sister Nelson's beautiful testimony. We're looking forward to hearing tomorrow from Elder and Sister Holland. When we served in Chile, we had the wonderful opportunity of being there at the same time as the Hollands. They were so kind to our family. 
In fact, I have to tell you a little experience that happened with Whitney and with Elder Holland. She found the following math problem in her school textbook. Yesterday, it took Jeff Holland one hour to get to work. <laughs> this morning, Jeff drove to the train station in 20 minutes, waited for the train for seven minutes, rode the train for 12 minutes, and then walked for 15 minutes to get to work. How long did it take Jeff to get to work this morning? Whitney thought it was so funny to see Elder Holland's name in a school book that she copied the page and sent it to him. <laughs> Attached, she wrote a note that said, would you please help me with my homework? <laughs> Not to be outdone, soon Whitney received the following letter from Elder Holland. Dear Whitney, I was pleased you discovered my day job. I regularly submit math problems for textbooks, <laughs> and sometimes I just don't know whose name to use. <laughs> I think I will use yours next. <laughs> if Whitney Wilcox has five boyfriends in Provo <laughs> and gains one a day for 14 days in Chile, how many of them will be baptized, go on missions, and want to marry her? Thanks for being here. I am immensely proud of you, Jeff Holland. Like you, we are very excited to listen to Elder and Sister Holland tomorrow. In Ether 12.4, we read, Wherefore, whoso believeth in God might with surety hope for a better world, yea, even a place at the right hand of God, which hope cometh of faith, maketh an anchor to the souls of men, which would make them sure and steadfast, always abounding in good works, being led to glorify God. Steadfastness and good works come from hope and faith, but not just any faith. Many people who are not members of the Church believe in God. They even like to swap stories over the Internet about God and angels. Still, their faith doesn't affect or change them. They rarely make any choice in their lives differently because of their professed faith than if they had no faith at all. Faith is not an anchor to them. That helps me better understand what Joseph Smith taught in the lectures on faith. He said that faith is more than knowing there is a God. It is knowing God, knowing His attributes and His relationship to us. We must know that He has a plan for us and that we are living in accordance with that plan. Many people believe there is a higher power, but without knowing Him, they are limited in accessing that higher power to help them improve. Elder Richard G. Scott of the Quorum of the Twelve has said, You must understand and use the power of the interaction of faith and character. God uses your faith to mold your character. In turn, fortified character expands your ability to exercise faith. That is the life-changing cycle that many have yet to discover. Christians have faith in Jesus Christ, but not a true faith, as Joseph Smith described. Millions of Christians in this world follow Christ, and many do so with all sincerity of heart. But it is one thing to follow Christ and another thing entirely to be led by Him. Latter-day Saints are the only Christians on this globe who are led by Christ, the same way He has always led His people through living prophets and apostles. That sets our faith apart. Just as Joseph Smith defined a true faith in God, Today, Wendy and I testify that a true faith in Christ is more than just knowing about Him, like many in the world, or even believing He is divine, like many Christians in the world. We must know His Atonement is real, we must use it to be transformed, and we must realize it is a continuous force in our lives. First, then. We must know Christ's Atonement is real. I remember a man in Chile who asked, Who needs a Savior? 
Obviously, he has no understanding of the fall and its effects. He certainly doesn't understand the precariousness and limited duration of his present state. Perhaps this man has not yet felt the sting of death, but he will. Perhaps he has justified and rationalized his sins for so long that he doesn't feel the sting of guilt, remorse, and shame, but he will. Sooner or later, someone close to him will die, and he will know what it is like to feel as if a part of his soul is being buried right along with the body of his loved one. On that day, he will hurt, and he will need a savior. Sooner or later, he will run out of escape routes and have to face himself in the mirror, knowing full well that his sinful, selfish choices have affected others as well as himself. On that day, he will hurt, and he will need a savior. But the blessings of the Atonement are not limited to freedom from death and sin. It is also there when we feel down, overwhelmed, afraid, and alone. And some of you knows you know how that feels. The Atonement is there when we face sickness, pain, or the consequences of the choices of others. And some of you know how that feels. The Atonement is even there when we make mistakes, not intentional sins, just stupid mistakes. And some of you know how that feels. When we hurt, we need a Savior. John the Baptist cried, Prepare ye the way of the Lord. Every valley shall be filled, and every mountain and hill shall be brought low. That is what Jesus does for us. If the knuckles of my hand represent the valleys and mountains of my life, it is Jesus who offers to hold my hand through both the highs and the lows. He makes the mountains manageable, and He fills the valleys. I had a religion class here at BYU taught by Guinevere Wollstone-Hume, who may be here today, and she was a fabulous teacher. She told us that the word atonement comes from an ancient Hebrew word, kafar, which means to cover. Isn't it interesting that when Adam and Eve discovered their nakedness in the Garden of Eden, God sent Jesus to make coats of skins to cover them? Coats of skins don't grow on trees. They had to be made from an animal, which means an animal had to be killed. Perhaps that was the very first animal sacrifice. Because of that sacrifice, Adam and Eve were covered. And in the same way, through Jesus' sacrifice, we are also covered. When Adam and Eve left the garden, the only things they could take to remind them of that place were the coats of skins. The one thing we take with us out of the temple to remind us of that heavenly place is a similar covering. I'm always surprised when I hear women say that they don't like their garment or that they don't think it is feminine enough. The garment reminds us of covenants, protects us, and even promotes modesty. However, to me, it is much more. The garment is a powerful and personal symbol of the Atonement, a constant reminder both night and day that because of Jesus, I am covered. But is it enough to know that the Savior sacrificed for us, that His Atonement is real? Many Christians know of these realities without fully understanding their complete purpose. Our second point today is that we must use the Atonement to be transformed. Jesus did not come only to save us, but also to redeem us. Most of my life, I've thought the two terms were synonymous, but that is not the case. The second question in the Temple Recommend interview is, do you have a testimony of the Atonement of Christ and His role as Savior and Redeemer? The two words describe two separate roles, 
and having a testimony of both roles is essential. By definition, a redeemer is one who buys or wins back, one who frees us from captivity or debt by the payment of ransom, one who returns or restores us to our original position. However, since my mission in Chile, I have come to appreciate an additional definition. A redeemer is one who changes us for the better. If our whole goal is just to be in God's presence again, then why did we leave it in the first place? In the pre-mortal existence, we already were with God, but we were also painfully aware that we were not like Him physically or spiritually. We wanted to be like our heavenly parents and knew it was going to take a lot more than dressing up in their clothes the way little children do. We needed to fill their shoes and not just clomp around in them. The goal is not just being with God. It is being like God. It is common to hear people say, God loves us and wants us back, but that is only partially right. Christ's redemption doesn't just put us back where we were. It makes us better. God loves us so much, He doesn't just want us back. He wants us better. Some of you, and I won't ask for a raise of hands, are old enough to remember the Six Million Dollar Man. I think he would cost a little more today. At the beginning of the TV show, the voice would say, we can rebuild him. We can make him better than before. That's what Jesus does for us. At Easter time, we sing the hymn, He is Risen by Cecil Francis Alexander. The text speaks of Christ's saving role, his victory over death, and how he, he has freed us from sin. But notice how the third verse also speaks of Christ's redeeming role. It says, he is risen, he is risen. He hath opened heaven's gate. We are free from sin's dark prison, risen to a holier state. John W. Welch has taught that the parable of the Good Samaritan can be viewed as an allegory of the fall and redemption of mankind. A certain man, Adam, fell and was left for dead. Finally, a Samaritan, he who is hated of men, Christ, saved him. But the Samaritan didn't just bind his wounds and restore him to the health he enjoyed previously. He also took him to an inn and paid additional funds to take care of him. Based on this allegory, Christ's redemption does not stop with restoring us to life. It also provides a better quality of life. Once, after a lesson about how Jesus had suffered for all of us, a young man said to my dad, I never asked Jesus to do that for me. If anyone has to suffer for my sins, I will do it for myself. This young man was ignorant of the amount and degree of suffering we are talking about. In D.N.C. 1918, the Lord says, which suffering caused myself, even God, the greatest of all, to tremble because of pain and to bleed at every pore and to suffer both body and spirit. But along with not understanding the extent of the suffering, this boy was also ignorant of just what suffering can and cannot do. DNC 19 makes it clear that those who do not repent and accept Jesus' atonement must suffer even as he did. So will that cocky teenager be able to suffer for his own sins and then waltz in the celestial kingdom and live with God and his family eternally? Will he be beaten with a few stripes and at last be saved in the kingdom of God? No. The Book of Mormon makes it clear that such an idea is false, vain, and foolish. While one can meet the demands of justice by suffering for his own sins, such suffering will not change him. Just as a criminal can pay his debt to justice by doing time in prison and walk out no different, suffering alone 
does not guarantee change. Real change can only come through Jesus. We must accept Christ not because it will save us some pain down the road, but because it is the only way we can become new creatures. No one walks into the celestial kingdom simply because the debt is paid, whether it's paid by Jesus or by ourselves. The justified must still be sanctified. Those who dwell with God are those who have come to be like Him. Through fulfilling what He asks, He who met the conditions of justice now turns to us with a few conditions of His own. What He asks of us does not pay justice, but helps us change. Christ asks faith, repentance, ordinances, and covenants not to pay justice, but to allow the Spirit to begin to change and sanctify us. When I was younger, I imagined the final judgment as a time when people would be begging Jesus to let them stay in His presence, and He would have to say, sorry, but you missed it by two points. <laughs> then the person would beg Jesus to reconsider. Now that I have more experience, I imagine the scene quite differently. Instead of an unworthy person saying, let me stay, let me stay, I think he will be saying, let me leave, let me leave. The unworthy will choose to leave Christ's presence because they will not be comfortable. I don't think people will have to be kicked out. Sadly, they will leave on their own. I've heard our, mortal, our current mortal condition described with many examples. Some say we are in a hole. Others say we are in debt or that we are lost. Whatever the analogy, Jesus doesn't just save us by lifting us out of the hole. He redeems us by lifting us to a much higher plane. He doesn't just save by paying the debt. He redeems us by paying us in addition. He doesn't just save by finding the lost. He redeems by guiding us home. Jesus not only opened to us the possibility of returning to God's presence, but also of returning with His image in our countenance. Redemption is more than paying justice and bringing everyone back to God. It is mercifully giving us the opportunity of being comfortable there. Not only can we go home, but we can also feel at home. The Atonement is real, and through repentance and sanctification, it is transforming. But that transforming change is a process that takes time, a long time. That leads us to our final point, which is that the Atonement is a continuous force in our lives. Perfection is the ultimate goal, but we get lots of chances to reach it. Our friend Brett Sanders once pointed out a lesson to be learned when a new priest is blessing the sacrament. The young man is nervous. He messes up when reading the prayer. He knows the prayers have to be perfect, and that expectation can't be lowered. So what happens when the priest makes a mistake? He looks at the bishop, who nods his head, and the priest simply begins again. Well, what if he stumbles a second time or a third? Does he finally just give up, or is there a, a trap door that opens up and he falls through? No, he just starts again. How many times? As many times as it takes to get it right. When I had the opportunity of serving as a bishop of a BYU ward, a young man came to me to confess, and I mean confess, with a capital C-O-N-F-E-S-S. -S. He unloaded everything he had ever done wrong since elementary school. I heard what he had never had the courage to tell another bishop, stake president, mission president, or parent. While the sins were not of major proportions, they needed to be confessed and should have been taken care of years earlier. You can imagine the young man's relief and joy when he finally let go of all that he had been carrying so needlessly, privately, 
and personally for so long. We prayed. We reviewed some scriptures together. We discussed the role of confession in the repentance process, and we set some goals for the future. When that young man left my office, he almost floated out of the room. The following Sunday, I looked for him in church but didn't see him. The next week, he wasn't there either. I called his apartment and left messages. Finally, I just went over. The young man answered the door, but he didn't invite me in. His countenance was dark. His eyes were hollow. His comments were negative and sarcastic, revealing his depressed mood. I asked if I could come in and talk with him. He said, oh, yeah, like that's going to make any difference. His words were cold and hard. Just face it, Bishop. The church isn't true. No one can even prove there's a God. It's all just a big joke, so just stop wasting your time. Oh, wow. From floating on air to the pit of despair, and all in a matter of days. Isn't that interesting? My first reaction was to become angry. I mean, he had no call to be treating me so rudely. I also wanted to, 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 I wanted to defend the truthfulness of the church. I wanted to defend the existence of God. But then I had one of those bishop moments. And instead of raising my voice or quoting scripture, I simply said, you messed up again, didn't you? His darkened expression melted, and this young returned missionary began to cry. Between sobs, he motioned me into his empty apartment, and we sat together on the couch. He said, Bishop, I'm sorry. I just feel so bad. I finally repented. I was finally clean. I finally put it all behind me. I finally used the atonement, and it felt so good. Then I blew it all over again. Now my former sins have returned, and I feel like the worst person in the world. Oh, I said, so the church is true. <laughs> there is a God after all. He said, of course. I said, so you just need another chance. He said, but that's the problem. DNC 58, 43. By this may ye know if a man repenteth of his sins. Behold, he will confess them and forsake them. I confessed I didn't forsake, so I didn't really repent. It's over. I said, tell me about the Savior's grace then. He said, oh, you know, 2 Nephi 25, 23. We are saved by grace after all we can do. We do our best, then Christ makes up the difference. But I did that, and it didn't work. I still went out and did the same old dumb thing. I blew it. Nothing changed. I said, hold on. What do you mean Christ makes up the difference? Christ doesn't only make up the difference. He makes all the difference. He requires us to repent, but not as part of paying justice, only as part of helping us to change. The young man said, wait, I thought it was like buying a bike. <laughs> I pay all I can, and then Jesus pays the rest. I said, I love Brother Robinson's parable. He has helped us all to see that there are two essential parts, and both parts must be completed. But I think of it more like this. Jesus already bought the whole bike. The few coins he asks from me are not so much to help pay for the bike but rather to help me value it and appreciate it. The return missionary said, either way, doesn't matter since I just crashed the bike. <laughs> 
so much for grace. I said, wait, what do you mean? What do you mean so much for grace? You think this is just a one-shot deal? Don't you realize that Jesus has a whole garage full of bikes? <laughs> Knowing that Christ makes the difference doesn't mean much unless we also realize how often he does it. The miracle of the atonement is that he will forgive our sins, plural. And that is not just multiple sins, but also multiple times we commit the same sin. Oh, of course we don't condone sin. Joseph Smith taught clearly that repentance is a thing that cannot be trifled with every day. Still, the same Jesus who forgives those who know not what they do will also forgive those of us who know exactly what we do and just can't seem to stop. I said to the return missionary, Christ commanded us to forgive others 70 times, seven times, and we don't think he's going to forgive us more than once? The young man's face began to show hints of a smile. He said, what you're saying is that there's still hope for me. I said, oh, now you're beginning to understand grace. In 1 Corinthians 15, 9, we read that there is always hope in Christ. Elder Neil A. Maxwell called the gospel inexhaustible. Isn't that a great word? My mom loves words. That's one that's right at the top of her list. Inexhaustible. Perhaps that's a good word for the atonement as well. The inexhaustible atonement. We hear many words associated with the atonement. We hear it is infinite, eternal, everlasting, perfect, divine, incomprehensible, inexplicable. We even hear that it is personal and individual. However, there is another word that must be more closely associated with the atonement if we are ever going to maintain hope in this world full of addictions. And that word is continuous. The continuous atonement. In Preach My Gospel, it says, ideally, repenting of a specific sin should be necessary only once. However, if the sin is repeated, repentance is available as a means of healing. Repentance may involve an emotional and physical process. So next time a priest in your ward has to begin the sacrament prayers again, next time he has to start over, just remember that is what the sacrament is all about. That is what the atonement is all about, the continuous atonement. Verbal expressions of belief or faith can't save us. True faith always results in faithfulness. True faith in Jesus Christ is trust in, confidence in, and reliance upon the atonement. We must know it is real, that its purpose is to transform us, and that it will be there as long as that perfecting process takes. It is, as my dad says, continuous. With that testimony, we, like the return missionary my dad spoke about, can surely hope for a better world, yea, even a place at the right hand of God. That is the hope and true faith that becomes an anchor to our souls. When we, or those we love, are stuck in cycles of compulsive behavior, and we say, I'll never do it again, and then we do it, and then we say, I'll never do it again, and then we do it. And then we say, this is so stupid. I will never do it again. And then we do it. There is always hope. We don't have to pretend there is no God. 
or desperately try to find reasons why the church isn't true so that we can avoid change. We don't have to seek out others who are struggling so that we feel justified or hate those who aren't struggling so that we can feel better. We don't have to even hate ourselves. And some of you here know how that feels. We don't have to hate ourselves. We just have to let faith be an anchor for our souls, and we have to begin again. How many times? As many times as it takes. When Sister Kathleen H. Hughes, formerly of the General Presidency of the Relief Society, instructed those who are presenting at Women's Conference, she counseled us to bear our testimonies, not casually or even as an afterthought, but very directly. And I would now like to do that. I know that there is a plan for each of us. I attended a session this morning with the conversion stories of three sisters, and it just emphasized the fact that God is so individually aware of what we're doing. The whole point of this earthly experience is to give us the chance to become like our Heavenly Father. How many people do you know who end up going into the professions that their parents are in? Is it really that strange to think that we are going into what our Heavenly Father and Mother do? I know this Church is a blessing in our lives and that it provides powerful, true doctrine. I am grateful to be covered by the Atonement and to have a symbol of that covering in the garment that I wear daily. I love my Father in Heaven, who has guided my steps so tenderly and allowed for so many of my dreams to come true. And when some don't, and there are days when I feel like I will never be enough, I still trust Him, and I always will. My testimony can never fail me, and that is what makes it an anchor to my soul. And I want you all to know that I love you and that I want you all to feel the same way. You did so great. <laughs> I wish every father could have daughters like Wendy and Whitney who love the Lord and bear testimony of Him. I too know from my experience my study, and for many witnesses and confirmations of the Spirit to my spirit, that Jesus loves us, that He lifts us up, and that He leads us today. What an honor it has been to be here at Women's Conference with you. When we prayed this morning to ask for the Spirit to be with us. I never, I never dreamed that that prayer would be answered so directly. Here we are in a building that is so huge and with so many people. And yet I have felt the Spirit in profound ways throughout this day and as we've had this chance to talk together. The Spirit has been here. And I hope that it has touched your spirit and that that is the memory that you will take with you home from Women's Conference. Not just the rain, not just the hail. I hope you'll remember 
the spirit that has touched us, comforted us, and testified to us that we have a Savior who covers us, a Redeemer who transforms us, and a Good Shepherd who is willing to go in search of us again and again and again, continuously. We say this in the name of Jesus Christ. Amen.